Trade talks, Wells Fargo, and Lyft are what the streets columnists and editors are watching. I'm Catherine Ross, live at the NYC with Jim Kramer. Jim, investors have a lot to think about. Let's start with Lyft. Yeah, well, look, I, we've done a, uh, some really good work on Lyft. Uh, and I would tell you that 75 uh, and below is really special, good prices, because you've got 100% growth. It's very hard to find. Uh, remember, this is duopoly, so that means this is probably not going to be a lot of price cutting. It's incredible that the country got divided between Lyft and Uber, right? There really isn't anybody else. I like that kind of uh, economic scheme. Uh, I know that they're losing money. People are going to say, well, wait a second, why would you pay up for losing money? There are a lot of great companies that were losing money when they came public, so that's not necessarily good enough reason to be able to sell. I know Warren, B or not involved, I know Warren Buffett said he never bought an IPO. Well, you see, you know, this is the kind of problem I have. Warren Buffett is different from the rest of us, okay? I have been saying, listen, if you've been in the market and, the, and a broker is offering you a uh, lift and we know it's going to go to premium because they've engineered it, well, you know, you're not Warren Buffett and you're not rich. He's keeping you in shackles by saying that. And that's a shame. Uh, it's a shame because he's a professional investor and he is at, he has a style. But if someone's going to give you money for being a good customer, uh, you take that money. You, you know, there's no purity to this. And this is one where at the beginning of a long series, this is, all I'm doing is talking about the life cycle of this period. At the beginning of a long series of IPOs, they make the first ones good. So if you can get some stock, it'll be priced well. And I think that this is a very good company. I, I do expect them to be able to increase their margins, do well over time. I do not think it's a loser business. I think it's a winner business, particularly because it's a duopoly. Do you think that they're going to be profitable in the near future? Not in the near future. It doesn't make sense. They want to continue to grow, grow, grow. I wish they would move into other businesses. I think they just do lift eats. But uh, I, a lot of people have to understand that when a company loses money in, in, in a quest for growth, that's a belief that you might have the next Amazon. And there's nothing wrong with that. Look, we accept it with biotechs. All the biotechs lose money, right? And they lose money until they hit it big. Uh, I feel this is like, again, the brainwashing. Uh, if you only do index funds, you're smart. And if you do individual stocks, you're bad. If you never say yes to IPOs, you're smart. And if you do say yes to IPOs, you're dumb. It would have been very good had Warren Buffett, and you're not really allowed to criticize certain people. I'm not criticizing, but if Warren Buffett just said, look, if they're giving away free money, you take the free money. And right now, Lyft, where they priced it, it was tight as a drum. At 72, there's a lot of demand higher. They made it tight as a drum. As we go through this period and we get to lousier deals, then I'm going to say, listen, you got to say no to that. But the brokers might say, hey, listen, I gave you all that Lyft. You got to help me. You got to come back and buy. So it's a, it's a horse trading game. And I, what I've always been trying to do is explain to people behind the scene what's really happening. And, you know, I'm not the late, great Anthony Bourdain, but this is what happens in the kitchen is there's just horse trade and negotiations. When you say, wait, when you say horse trading, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, you know, look, I'd like some lift. Well, you know, what are you going to do for me when the deals are bad? Are you going to put some, are you going to buy some of the bad? Lift is the good. We've engineered this one to be good. And when I say engineered, what that means is that they look at their demand they see they have orders as high as 80, say, 79, 80. So what they do is they say, listen, we're going to price it at 72. So actually, of course, anyone who's willing to pay 79, 80, certainly going to pay 72. So they give them that stock and they say, look, you know, in the aftermarket, you can buy the rest and, you know, get it. You know, maybe it's 90. And so maybe it's 92. You have 72 and you're 92. You got a basis uh, 82. Uh, your basis is below where it goes out. So it's a win for you. This is a process. What I'm describing is a process. And people don't understand that there are processes. Now, how do I know this? Maybe I'm making it up. No, okay. There were 350 IPOs that came public at the time of the street. I also did a lot of work in syndicate desk and I was a hedge fund manager for 14 years. So I, I know the process. No one wants to talk about the process. Uh, the, streets op, the streets deal was botched by, uh, by Goldman, which was my broker. Uh, because they misunderstood the over-the-transom retail buying from people who read the street. And I kept telling them that was going to happen. And right at the end, there was an outfit called Knight that came in, with, batched all these retail orders, put them in a market, you know, no limit, market. And instead of the stock opening between 25 and 28, which is what I was hoping for, it opened at 62, 63. And to me, it destroyed a lot of our brand equity. And the fights that I had over that subsequently, and uh, there was also, I mean, I ended up sussing it out and realizing it was Knight, not Goldman. So in the big lawsuit, I sided with, I'm the only, I was one of the few people who sided with Goldman and all the different challenges about what Goldman did wrong. But what happened is they lost control. 
And so I went, uh, and that's what happened in Facebook. They lost control. So you want the book runners to, to keep control, have an orderly opening, price it at a price where you know that there's still demand above, so you make a pop. You don't disappoint the owners of Lyft, but remember, the owners of Lyft have a lot of stock behind them anyway, so they're not greedy if they're good people. Is a $72 opening a fair opening That's to you? Fabulous. Jeez, if you can get no, I don't think they'll do that. I mean, they're not pricing the deal to make it so it doesn't work. That's a deal that doesn't work. A deal where they open it at the price of where the stock was priced is a deal that doesn't work, and it's probably going to lead to a deal where the stock goes down. That's, the, that's again, it's part of the life cycle. I'm not being cynical. I'm, I'm just explaining. And there are a lot of people who have been new to the game and weren't in it in the 80s and 90s, uh, and I'm just trying to fill you in about the way it works when you have a big skein of deals, like the deal that I lived through, which is the street. Now, which was just pathetic and horrible. I know that investors who are watching this probably want to know what your thoughts are by the end of the day today. Where do you think Lyft is going to be? Well, you know, like, let's see where it opens. I mean, I, there's no need for me to say, I mean, it's one of those where it's like, we're in the first inning, so uh, we're going to be able to have the benefit of the fifth, sixth inning before I have to come up with a ninth inning. Okay. You know, like, look, let's put it this way. In a world where um, everything is on Twitter and YouTube, whatever, why would I, you know, it, it, it does me no good. E even if I have a price in my head, I wouldn't give it. Fair. Very well, fair. It's like I look at it. I mean, some clown was castigating me yesterday uh, for, I don't know, some stock that we bought for Action Alerts. It was bad. And it's like, you know, what a clown. I mean, I'm out there doing it publicly. I, I, I was, you know, I'll say it, I, I had empirically the best numbers of any hedge fund manager during the 14 years that I was in it. Am I able to be a hedge fund manager? No, I have a lot of different rules now, but I know what goes on just by dint of the fact that I worked at Goldman, ran money, uh, and have run money uh, you know, open-handed and run the club. And I can tell you that this is a deal that I would want to be in. I would want to be in Lyft. I think it's good, and not to flip. Okay, let's switch gears. Let's okay. talk about the well, trade like talks. Why do you like Nike here? Well, Nike came down, and we did a piece at 82 saying it was really good. And the more work I've done on the quarter, the more I realize you just, it's very rare you got a high-quality company whose stock was down for the wrong reasons. Well, and Sorry. Nike's interesting right now because they have the men's business of, athlete, af, of athleisure, and Lulu has the women's business, and those two are going to start clashing. To, they're both trying to, well, I mean, Lulu's very small, Nike's very big. Uh, Lulu off a couple is a buy. Um, because it's got a multi-year trend. Wherever I go, in the last, like, I, I went to a terrific benefit. My wife's on the board of the Baby's Heart Fund. Uh, and uh, terrific benefit. All people want to talk about was whether Boeing was going to go to zero and lift to 100. It's interesting, actually, people talk about the stock market. That hasn't happened in a long time. And I, I remarked about the resilience of Boeing, and it seems to trade entirely on the, whether they get the patch done, the software. If they do, people just want to go buy, buy it. And that Lyft was, just because it was losing money doesn't mean it's a joke. Those are the things we talked about. What about the trade talks? Did you talk about that at all? No. I mean, you, you know, there are, people have to understand that there are people in the White House who want to continually leak that the talks are good. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to industry. I spend a lot of time talking to Washington. The talks aren't that good. The talks aren't that good because uh, Trump does not want to remove the current tariffs, even if they get a trade deal. And that's not something that is palatable to the Chinese. That's the sticking point. You don't hear any of the leak leakers uh, go to, to the press and say, hey, listen, it, it, you know, if, if our government insists on keeping those tariffs, it could blow up the talks. But that should be front and center for people. As should be a, a new twist that came up, which is that the president asked Xi to stop fent bad fentanyl coming to this country. And there's been a number of instances since then from Ch of Chinese fentanyl. Now, that may sound like a niggling small thing, but the president has been known to focus on myopic issues. Now, one thing that I've seen is the market's up, and I've asked you before on this show how traders and investors can protect their portfolios, but now I'm going to ask raise you. Cash. Raise cash. Well, so, yes, not, but know, what look, can they do raise, right now? We raise cash because we think that when this gauntlet is over of, of IPOs, the market's going to be lower. Uh, and that's just been the history of it. And we want to have the cash to be able to buy some of our faves. All right. Now, Jim, 
Before we jump into our next topic on Wells Fargo, by the way, I just want to quickly remind our audience to check out our Real Money Premium subscription because every day Jim writes three columns and you got to make sure. Nobody knows. It's really interesting. You know, you, you get instant feedback on Twitter and there's a shocking number of people who don't know that I blog, that I write every day on realmoney.com. And some of that is because people won't pay for a subscription product. Although I think that they ought to wake up to the fact that there's three million people who do pay for the Times. Uh, and I blog all the time. And I did I did a cogent piece today that talked about uh, my thinking about Wells and the thinking I have as uh, dealing with Tim Sloan. I had uh, probably a better relationship with Tim in the media than anybody. Forged over what I thought was uh, a conflict because I thought that the 110-page Sherman Sterling report uh, raised questions about Tim. And I got satisfactory answers enough to realize that Tim Sloan was one of the good guys. However, he did work at Wells Fargo, so therefore he was the pinata that uh, Senator Warren wanted very badly. I am close to Senator Warren, too. I know it was going to be relentless. It was just going to be relentless. It was not going to end. And in the end, that was going to be a distraction for the bank. Tim knew that. And so Tim did what I think he promised to do on Mad Money, which is resign. If now, it happened. I think this is interesting because my first thought, I see this headline cross CNBC last night, and my first thought is, oh, he must have gotten pushed out. And no. you took the opposite approach well, to that. True. Which I think is very, he well, was not pushed exactly. Out. And I think that's very interesting. No, I mean, now, he, he just got a raise. He just got a 5% raise, $18 million, three weeks ago. I mean, but why, why was it? Can you explain that, why he wasn't pushed out? Well, he wasn't pushed out because he was doing a good job. They had great earnings. He also had, it broomed a lot of the people who were bad. Remember, a lot of it was timing. When he became the head of the bank, a lot of people felt that what he should have done is just immediately fired everybody. But he, that's not the kind of man he is. Uh, he's a prudent man who then examined the charges and then did indeed replace the people he felt were involved. But the problem is, is that if you look at the way Wall Street works, if you're an executive of a bank, even if you don't know what's happening, your head's supposed to fall. The board put him in. Did he want the position? He wanted to do what's right for shareholders. He's, he, he has said to me over and over again, what's right for shareholders, what's right for shareholders. You, you could think he's just mocking it, but no, he's, he means it. He means it. See, now that, guys, is the kind of insight that you're missing on realmoney.com because you wrote about this. Yeah. That was in your column. Yeah, well, look, I have 35,000 columns. Actually, exactly. more than that. But I, I started Real Money in 1999 in order to be able to give people the insight that uh, and write about what I cared about and it's been 20 years and now, now people are starting to hear about it now I do have a I have a quick question sure. about Wells and that is where does it go from here if I'm an investor it's in it's a bank stock I, I said last night don't buy any bank stocks you, you did know. say and you've told us not well to buy I mean any like bank look stocks. I mean someone was uh, haranguing me about some bad stocks that that uh, actual owns I, I have news for people nobody else shows you their holdings there's a lot of company, There's a lot of fund managers who own bad stocks. We were trying to diversify into the financials. The financials have been terrible. Okay, we're down. We're down underwater on Goldman. Now, most people do not. No money manager ever reveals where they are. That's the whole point. They would never do it because they would never get any money in. We're running a charitable trust, and we're trying to explain people. They are not as linked as I as I can be because of our our policy of being frozen to protect us and protect people who do. Uh, who subscribe, who are members. If I'm in Wells already, what should I do as an investor? Hold, well, see, this sell? Is thing. This is like owning City. I would not sell. Uh, is Wells the worst of the banks? No, it was doing well. Um, but the banks trade as an ETF because that's this ETFization that I always talk about. So it really doesn't matter. I mean, you could own JP Morgan or you could own City. They're all trading together. There's no differentiation between banks anymore. Now, I've got a fun question for you, sure. and I want to move on to our investing yeah, education sure. segment. And if you guys saw on Twitter, I tweeted about it. Now, Jim, I want to circle back to Lyft because I think that this is really important, and this is something that Annie Gauss wrote on the street she's about the... Good. She's, she's very good. Piece this morning is really good. Yeah, and she wrote about the dual-class shares of Lyft and what that means. Now, I want to take a step back from Lyft and just ask you, in general, when you hear about a dual-class share structure, what does that mean? Well, I don't like it because I like democracy. Um, I, when I started the street, I decided not to have dual class. Um, in retrospect, for my family, that was a mistake. Uh, we would have done much better. I actually think the street would have been much better. 
but I, I favor democracy. Now you can say, Jim, that was a controversial statement. No, it's, it's how my wife feels. It's how my ex-wife feels, uh, whom I'm in contact with constantly. We just felt, well, Jim, you worked your ass off and you didn't have any control, uh, but you had to, you went and stupidly didn't do the two class. Uh, I say I favored shareholder democracy, so I can't go against my view. My life would have been much easier and happier over the last 20, to be philosophic about it, over the last 24 years, but I was not in control because I did not believe in two classes. I think that when I listen to these two gentlemen, I think that they want the ability to be able to run the company uh, unimpeded, um, and I don't, I like democracy, but I'm not going to say that they're wrong because maybe they can do a better job these days. I, I would still choose, if I did ours over, no, I would do tool, tool class. I would do tool class because I would not, I would like to be happier. These guys will have a happier life. And that's something that millennials choose. But let's talk about the millennials. So let's say as a millennial, which I'm sure there are millennials watching, I'm just getting into the stock market. Yeah. I just downloaded Robinhood and I see someone talk Smart. about dual class share structure. What dual would class that does not have the accountability. But what is it? Well, it's like they have more votes than you. It's a, um, I always called it a Yunker state. That's J-U-N-C-K-E-R. So Google Yunker. It's a Yunker state. Some people have more votes than others. And I've always felt that the Yunker regime was a bad regime. And I mention this because it's historical. And I like to put things in the context of history. All right, Jim. Thank you so much. And if you're watching us on Facebook or on thestreet.com, we're now jumping over to our Action Alerts Plus members only show. Jim will be sharing more of his thoughts on Viacom and more holdings in his Action Alerts Plus portfolio. You can check it out at actionalertsplus.com. Also, today, we are doing a free TurboTax webinar on thestreet.com for people who have not done their taxes yet, like me. Um, and you can find it on thestreet.com at 1 p.m. That'll be smart. I mean, I used to spend hours trying to figure it out. I have outsourced my debit. I have a very tough, I have 32 different entities. 32? Well, I have a That's lot of different a lot. things going. A lot of different things going. Oh my, you're a poor accountant. All right, guys. No, we'll he's not poor, he's rich. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way, but that's another way to take it. All right, guys, we'll see you on Monday.